Hi, we're Sriram and Kathy, and we're here to talk about higher order functions. Higher order functions are functions that take other functions as arguments. You may know them from some of their greatest hits, like map, filter, and reduce. For instance, we can map a list of numbers to get a list of strings, filter valid email addresses, or combine rows to make tables. Higher order functions are ubiquitous in programming. Every modern language has them. Some even brag about it. However, higher order functions are also missing in some places. Java. OK, that got fixed a few years ago through the addition of the stream libraries. So even Java has caught up. Oh, and one last place, computing education research. We should fix that. OK, seriously now. Higher order functions are a construct, but they can have several conceptualizations. One common view is as abstractions of particular pieces of code, especially over data structure traversal. Many books and tutorials take this perspective. However, when we try to use them as programmers, that's often not how we approach them. Rather, we think of them as in terms of an intended behavior. I want to uniformly transform this list. I want to pick out just the relevant items from that list. That's what we focus on in this paper. Let's look at a concrete example. Consider this input-output pair, which converts the list red, green, blue to the numbers 3, 5, 4. We would want a programmer to recognize this as an instance of mapping, here computing the length of each string, and thus tag it with map, the higher order function that would canonically produce this behavior. Similarly for the other examples on this slide. Observe that the tags may not be unique. For some examples, multiple functions could have produced that behavior. Ultimately, then, we can build high-level summaries of behaviors along several key characteristics. For instance, let's look at three functions, map, filter, and or map. All the functions in this paper consume lists, so let's focus on what differs. We can start by looking at their output type. Two of them produce lists. The third produces a Boolean. For the list producers, we can focus on further behaviors like the length and element type. Map, for instance, produces output of the same length, but the type can be different. Filter keeps the elements, but not necessarily all of them. In this way, we can build up a table that presents a behavioral summary of these functions. The paper has a much more detailed one. Recognizing behavior is especially relevant when we use examples to drive plan composition and decomposition. This is foundational to both computer science and data science. Given this background, we set out to study two main questions. Roughly, after students have had some experience with higher order functions, which features do they properly recognize? The precise research questions are in the paper. We did this in the context of an accelerated introductory course, so about two thirds had had prior programming experience and about a third did not. Students learned to program with higher order functions and did multiple iterations of our activities before and after the semester. There are a lot more details in the paper. In designing tasks for students, we were inspired by activities in machine learning. We asked students to do three kinds of tasks, clustering, labeling, and classification. In our use, clustering is putting things into groups based on similarity, labeling is giving tags to pictures, and classification is giving tags based on input-output behavior, exactly like we saw earlier in the talk. We very carefully designed sets of input-output pairs to cover various characteristics we wanted, including ambiguity and impossibility. Here's what we learned. First, the students ultimately did fairly well, getting better with successive iterations. At the same time, they did also make certain kinds of errors. Second, when two different functions had similar features, students get, did get tripped up by those similarities. Third, we learned a lot about how to design our study better. In particular, we asked them to cluster before classifying, but we should have gone in the opposite order. Fourth, we've created one instrument in particular that will be useful not only to researchers, but also to educators. Finally, completely independent of higher order functions, we found thinking about tasks through the lens of clustering and classification very useful and a great way to elicit student understanding. We can see lots of other uses for that perspective. If you like this work and want to build on it or discuss it, 
especially if you teach higher order functions, do get in touch with us. Thank you.